afternoon, everyone. Do you hear okay? Thank you. Churchill said that the first casualty of war is truth. That's certainly true of the war in Ukraine. The kinetic war playing out on the plains of the Donbass and in the islands of the Black Sea is matched by a ferocious propaganda war being played on a telegram and Facebook and other social media platforms. The kinetic war is pretty well covered in the mainstream media, but who's winning the propaganda war? Luckily, we have a couple of really good experts to answer that question. We're joined by Melody Smith, who's the head of digital analysis at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, and among other posts, uh, a fellow with the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. And Justin Zeef, just back from Ukraine himself, um, former operations officer of the US government, now co-founder and president of Nisos, which is a managed intelligence company that helps clients manage intelligence relevant to their risks, as well as coordinated disinformation and digital abuse campaigns. Welcome, Justin and Melanie. Thank you. All right, let's get down to it. After the Russians failed in their attempts to capture Kyiv to the north and turned their efforts to the conflict in the east, the shape of the battlefield changed. The Russians, who had lost momentum, regained it. Is the same true in the propaganda war? Have the Russians reestablished momentum there? Uh, Justin, from your experiences, what would you say? I, I would say that uh, overall it's a war, and there are battles in a war, and some battles will be won by one party and others by the other. Um, in many ways, the Russians are failing in their propaganda efforts internal to Ukraine. Uh, consider Kyiv, for example, uh, typically a Russian-speaking city. Uh, now, after February, the invasion and uh, the ramp-up of the war that's really gone on since 2014, uh, many Ukrainians are actively seeking to speak Ukrainian, uh, even if at home they were previously speaking Russian. Uh, at the same time, you've got uh, the Ukrainian government, which elected uh, early on to ban Russian media and to limit access uh, of Russian material to the public, which I would argue is actually counterproductive to their point of you know, demonstrating a free, free uh, you know, a society where anything can be allowed. Um, overall, I would say the Ukrainians are, uh, are winning this one so far. Okay. Um I think that a lot of us in uh, the U.S. and Canada, Western Europe, have the impression that the entire world is lined up behind Ukraine, and yet you'd have a very different perspective if you were in Asia, if you were in India or China or Latin America, let alone in Russia. Uh, does that mean that you know Russian penetration is better there, or is it just kind of a different, uh, different company, country goals? In Ukraine, you mean? Uh, I, yes, in regard to the Ukraine war. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very different in the sense that the cultures are closely aligned. Uh, even until a few years ago, uh, Russians and Ukrainians would freely cross the border back and forth between their countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, a heavy Russian-speaking Russian population in the Ukraine. So um, it's easier, in a sense, for the Russians to convince uh, certain pockets of Ukrainians that they are not the aggressor or that they are coming in to liberate. Uh, but when you hear claims in the media that, uh, you know, uh, there are Nazis in the Ukraine or that uh, there are people in the Ukraine who believe that there are Nazis and that they're, the Russians are coming in to liberate them, uh, I traveled all over the country and can assure you that is almost categorically false. Okay. Um, Melanie, um I mean, you at uh, ISD have been monitoring what the Russian propaganda is and uh, what the social media traffic is originating within Russia. What are the messages that they're trying to spread? They really differ from country to country. And I think we have to be aware of the fact that the Russian propaganda machine is highly responsive and it's tailored to different markets. Local sensitivities come into play. Um, just yesterday, when the news broke about Macron um, losing the parliamentary majority in France, for example, we saw RT and Sputnik, some of these Russian state media outlets, respond to that very quickly by putting out content. 
So they really differ in between countries. I think one thing that um, is in common across a lot of different places is that Russian state media is attempting to sow confusion and sow chaos in different places. Um, in the US, we see that taking the form of blaming the Ukraine war for rising gas prices, for example. So amplifying divisions that already exist within societies, but for a different end. Uh, okay, good. Um, it, has there been um, sort of, I, Justin brought up the idea that there were, um, the, the Russian message that the Ukrainian government was illegitimate, it was run by Nazis. Have you seen any traction for that notion? Yeah, we do see a lot of content online that is attempting to spread this narrative that Ukrainians are Nazis. We also see a lot of content about um, the denying of war crimes in various places. For example, in Bucha, we saw a campaign against, you know, arguing the veracity of the images and the videos that were coming out. Um, of alleged war crimes that were taking place on the ground. And really, it's the countries that have a relatively close proximity to Ukraine that receive a lot of that propaganda. So we're talking about Eastern and Western Europe um, because of their proximity to the events on the ground. But we, we released a study recently that showed that of the top 10 Facebook posts across 20 different countries, the posts about Butcher that were denying or casting doubt about war crimes taking place were shared at a rate of three times higher of that of verified reporting, of mainstream media reporting. Okay, good. Um, I, I, you know, it seems like another vulnerability for Russian propaganda would be in the nations of uh, Eastern Europe that are taking in a lot of refugees. And there's uh, always a narrative, and has been for many years, that uh, when the refugees were coming, say, from Syria, that, you know, our economy can't bear all this, the weight of all these people who are a burden on our welfare state. And do you think that that, and of course, that's a, pro, uh, a vulnerability that Russian propaganda can exploit. Do you think that's something that's going to wear on the resolve of Western countries to be able to maintain support for Ukraine? That's a good question. I think um, immigration is obviously one thing that we often look to see state sponsored disinformation really capitalizing on the idea that it's controversial or the idea that there are kind of two sides to this debate. So we are seeing a lot of content online, specifically on mainstream social media about Ukrainian refugees in different countries. Um, we're due to release a study next week looking at 10 different markets on Facebook and trying to understand how those narratives differ, for example, in between, you know, what is RT in Polish saying versus what RT in German is saying about refugees. But there are other issues that are kind of cross-cutting in that way and that the Russian propaganda machine really attempts to kind of so further division with. So one of those is the economy in the US. Uh, there's a lot to do with gun rights and LGBT yes. rights, for example. So it's just one of a myriad of issues. Okay, good. Uh, to play on the business angle that might be related to the conflict in Ukraine, an awful lot of uh, North American companies have pulled out of Russia, um, shut down their operations there. And it, it, I wonder if those countries can look at, or should be, should be looking at, should be worried about potential blowback from Russian disinformation operations. If you are a big corporation, your intention is to harm the Russian economy, can the country that is sort of the virtuosos in the di disinformation game, can you expect them to want to exact revenge on you in the future? Is this something that you're concerned uh, for some of your corporate clients about, Justin? Um, so, you know, we have large clients, and some of those clients have continued to operate in Russia, and others, most of them, have pulled out. I think that the concerns that they have around um, blowback, whether economic or reputational, are, are largely around the, uh, the business that they would generate in the country as opposed to any damage that could be caused uh, against them outside of the country. And moreover, I think the Russians are more concerned with the loss of the, jo the, the loss of employment, you know, for all of the people that these companies employed, the loss of taxable revenue, 
um, you know, all of the, the benefits that, that Russia would get from having those businesses operating in real time. And they're more focused on the economic costs and recouping those costs. And I just don't see a strong path to recouping those costs through disinformation campaign. So while punishing those companies who have left maybe on their roadmap, uh, you know, right now they have arterial bleeds and they're not going to be dealing with, you know, surface level scratches like that uh, right away. Okay. Melanie, you, I know you had some thoughts about what, uh, what the pullouts will mean for the information environment in Russia if media companies abandon, Western media companies abandon the country. Yeah, that's something that I worry about a lot. We saw, obviously, there are arguments that having access to Facebook, Twitter, TikTok increases your likelihood of receiving disinformation. However, the rapid close down and banning of those platforms within Russia means that you have a domestic population that's only really able to ingest information about the war in Ukraine from a handful of sources, most of which are state controlled. So I worry a lot about the vacuum that that's left in the information ecosystem within Russia, on top of foreign correspondents leaving from publications like the Washington Post, the New York Times, mainstream, what we would regard as relatively credible reporting, no longer being able to operate in the Russian territory. Okay. Um. There are two sides to this war. Uh, Russia is not the only country that has uh, interest in spreading their story around. And uh, as Churchill said, the first casualty is truth. He didn't distinguish between one side and the other. So Ukrainian propaganda, what exactly is their effort? Would you, and how would you compare them in terms of credibility versus uh, what is coming out of Russian state sponsored media, Justin? Yeah, um, I, I think there's some context important here to frame the question. Uh, so I just returned from three weeks of volunteering in the Ukraine uh, all over the country with an amazing organization called Help Ukraine 22, part of the uh, uh, Committee for Open Democracy. Um, and I observed a people that I didn't expect. Uh, what I observed is not what I expected. And, and, and having served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, I was, in, I was in, uh, accustomed to, to, to populations that which were happy that we were there, but very little interest in self-governance and uh, uh, running their, their country. Uh, you know, it's tribal, it's, it's, it's not uh, nationalistic. And in the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians are fiercely defensive of their country, very upset uh, about Russian aggression, and have the same level of support for the war against Russia as the United States had a week after Pearl Harbor. Uh, actually, one point higher, 98% to 97%. So if you understand what's driving the Ukrainians and their desire to keep the Russian aggressor out, you understand that it doesn't really take that much coordinated propaganda to adjust their mindset to want to drive the outcome which propaganda would typically have them driving toward, right? They already want what the national propaganda would be pushing them to do. Um, so, you know, to be honest, I haven't tracked a lot of internal propaganda uh, by Ukraine, uh, towards the Ukrainians. I can simply tell you uh, that by standing up to a, an imperial force that's knocking at their door, uh, I, I think uh, folks are showing who they are. Okay. But uh, Ukrainian propaganda isn't only aimed internally, or at least not to prejudice it, but Ukrainian messaging isn't only aimed internally, it's also aimed at us uh, and other countries that can be supportive. Do you think that there's any spin to the messaging from the Ukrainian government towards us in the West that we should be aware of? Uh, uh, Melanie, I'll ask you to address that first. Um, I would probably leave that one to Justin. Oh. I'm, obvi obviously, we have very little visibility online as to what's being told to the Ukrainian population and the Russian population at this point. Um, but I would just add that, obviously, in a very fast-paced, moving environment, when you do have a, an active war and an active conflict happening, things get messy very quickly. So what we see as propaganda that has been extremely well organized over decades from Russia is not what we're going to be seeing from Ukraine. Uh -huh. You might disagree. Yeah, how would you answer that? Um, 
I, I wouldn't dare to be prescriptive as to how you know Ukraine should be handling uh, its external communications. Yeah. I do think there are things that they could be doing better. Uh, one of those is the way that they message to the Western to Western society, those neighbors, uh, those countries that are outside of Europe specifically, because if you're Poland, right, you can talk about a refugee crisis, but at the end of the day, uh, the Poles understand that the reason the, all the animals are fleeing the forest is because the forest is on fire and forest fires move and so they are what's going to burn next. Um, so the motivation is built in to both protect those refugees and also to keep the Russians at bay. But it's also, I think, important uh, relative to my last point to remember that these are not just refugees who are running across the border and are helpless. Like These are people who have regular jobs this is a functioning democracy, which is doing an enormous amount of work to root out corruption, right? These are people who just want to be left alone to develop a democracy. So the fact that they're on your doorstep uh, asking for help uh, is not uh, indicative of, of that they would be doing this under any other circumstances, right? They were doing fine otherwise. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I, you know, I'm not a PR firm. I don't know exactly what they could or should be doing better, but I, I believe they need to engage better with, uh, with Western democracies outside of, uh, of Europe. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, I just one sort of in, in our last remaining seconds, if there's um, advice you would give uh, the audience, those of us who are in the West and are uh, deeply interested in the outcome of this conflict, what advice would you give about how to consume the news coming out of there? What percentage to believe? What sort of um, verification you would look for as a consumer of the news? Melanie? Um, there's a number of different things, probably too many to go into now, just in terms of best practice of consuming news from social media. But the top thing I would say is just be extremely critical of the sources. We kind of see that these actors from the Russian propaganda side are concentrated in those that have a very explicit affiliation to the Kremlin. But it's important to remember that there are swathes of people out there who are willing to carry those propaganda lines who don't have an explicit affiliation. So just do your research on who you're sharing information from. Good, good. Justin, you want to bring us home with an answer to that question? Yeah, real quick, I'd, I'd echo the words of Alan Kay, the American computer scientist who said, the easiest way to predict the future is to invent it. And so I would say, if you want to better understand the problem and you want to help solve the problem, go to where the problem is. Go see for yourself, go help, go volunteer. There's no shortage of opportunities to do that. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, just flag me at any point. But you need to get on the ground and, 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 and work and demonstrate that we're there to help and help them help themselves. All right, all right. So we'll end on a call to action. Uh, thank you for watching, Justin and Melanie. Thank you.